Hey everyone, welcome back to the Alberta Roundup and happy Saturday. I'm your host, Rachel Emanuel. For those of you who have been with me from the beginning, you're probably going to recognize my OG background. You guys are going to have to bear with me for a couple weeks as I'm in the process of moving and things are a little up in the air right now. Currently, I'm living in central Alberta where I'll be for a few more weeks before I move down to Calgary. But before I move on, I have to give a shout out to all my central Alberta fans. I've met so many of you over the past couple of weeks. In fact, something very interesting happened to me this week. On Thursday, I was preparing for the show when I heard a knock on the door. It was Michelle Bear, the NDP candidate for Red Deer South. Now, unfortunately, the NDP refused to take media requests from True North. They say they don't want any dealings with our credible news organization. So Michelle, my wish for you is that you will take my media requests and those of my colleagues at True North. I can assure you that the thousands of voters across Red Deer South will become more familiar with you and your party's policies if you take my media requests as they faithfully watch the Alberta Roundup and read my work. Okay guys, now that I'm finished with that very important public service announcement, it's time to move on to today's topics. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Alberta Recovery Conference, where the Premier and Alberta's Mental Health and Addiction Minister made some very important announcements. We're also going to be taking a look at a sole source contract Alberta Premier Danielle Smith's government awarded to someone who worked on her leadership campaign. Finally, we're going to be taking a look at Edmonton's 15-minute cities. I know you guys will have thoughts. And of course, we'll end with our weekly comment roundup. All that and more happening now on the Alberta Roundup. Speaking at the Alberta Recovery Conference on Tuesday, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith said Alberta is indisputably Canada's leader in a recovery oriented system of care. Now that's after four years of their efforts to stem the homelessness and addiction crisis that began under former Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. Smith said the devastating effects of addiction and homelessness are evident in Alberta and across North America, and it's a result of years of neglecting those systems of care. The Premier said that since being elected in 2019, the UCP government has sought to ensure that everyone has the right to pursue recovery. She said, quote, There are some of us that tell us that we have unreasonable expectations, predicting that recovery is not an achievable or even a realistic goal. But what they fail to understand is this. When we see recovery as possible, we are providing hope and optimism to people who are often living without any hope. We're saying that you can recover. And there is a better life for you that you deserve and that we will be there for you. The Premier also revealed some major budget 2023 numbers at the conference. Take a listen. It's clear that now is the time to continue moving forward and to continue investing in our system of care for Albertans. And to accomplish this, I'm pleased to announce here at the Alberta Recovery Conference that next week our government will table a budget, which will include record-breaking investments to a comprehensive mental health and addiction care system. In 2019, when we came to office, the mental health and addiction specific budget was only about $87 million a year. Next year alone, if passed, budget 2023 will provide $275 million in funding for the Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction. Speaking at the conference the following day, Alberta Mental Health and Addiction Minister Nicholas Milken revealed the new members on the government's Recovery Expert Advisory Panel. Those experts will advise the government on its recovery oriented system of care. The minister said the province needs to surround itself with the best possible advice. Here's what that sounded like. The Alberta model that we're building is anchored in research and the best practices from around the world. And we will continue to listen to experts in recovery as we build the recovery oriented systems of care across Alberta. That is why I'm very pleased to announce today that we have brought together a group of world-class experts to serve as the Recovery Expert Advisory Panel to the Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction. The panel is made up of 16 experts from diverse fields who will provide ongoing advice on research and innovation policy and standards development, as well as evaluation and outcomes reporting. These folks are some of the most accomplished and well-respected leaders, researchers, and practitioners from the fields of academia, addiction medicine, indigenous health, justice systems, and trauma-informed care. They are trailblazers and change makers, and they will be helping shape the Alberta model as we continue building the systems that change people's lives for the long term. The panel will be chaired by Dr. Keith Humphreys, uh, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Some of you may remember his presentation uh, from yesterday morning. 
uh, which I listened to very intently. And so thank you for uh, agreeing to do this and also thank you for presenting and being part of this uh, wonderful recovery conference. Dr. Humph Humphreys is an internationally renowned expert on addiction and public policy with more than 350 peer-reviewed articles to his name, and he recently served as the chair of the Stanford Lancet Commission Review of the North American Opioid Epidemic. He also served as the drug policy advisor to U.S. Presidents both Bush and Obama. Okay guys, moving into the controversy of the week, this story is from CBC News. The Alberta government awarded a $72,500 contract to a marketing agency owned partly by Danielle Smith's former campaign manager. The contract ran from November 1, 2022 to January 31 of this year to Nordic Media. That's owned by Matthew Altheim, who was Danielle Smith's campaign manager during the United Conservative Party leadership race. The contract was provided for digital media planning and strategic development. According to CBC News, a sole source contract, which provides services purchased by Alberta government departments without going out for bids, are permitted under specific circumstances. In the case of the Nordic Media sole source contract, the government of Alberta said this, where an unforeseeable situation of urgency exists and the services or the goods or services in respect of construction could not be untamed by means of open procurement procedures. I would be curious to see a little bit more numbers. $72,000 over three months is a lot of money. It is being paid to a company. I'm curious what the amount of hours of work were put in, as well as how many people were paid under this contract. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Do you think that this is a questionable contract or do you think it makes sense that the premier would have given this contract to a company with affiliations with her leadership campaign? Moving into what we're watching, we're finally going to talk about Edmonton's 15-minute cities. Edmonton recently announced that it's pursuing a neighborhood development plan aimed at creating a community of communities or small towns in our big city, in which residents can access everything they need within a short distance from home. According to the National Post, the plan was inspired by the concept of 15-minute cities, which is aimed at having neighborhoods with all amenities within a quarter-hour bike or walk. That includes groceries, schools, daycare, leisure, fitness, entertainment, and other amenities like shops and restaurants. But critics claim that such a proposal would bar people from traveling to per certain parts of the city, and that you'd be forced to spend 90% of your life within your own district while being monitored for carbon emissions. Of course, the city of Edmonton's proposal so far includes nothing of the sort. So a couple of weeks ago, I believe this happened two weeks ago, there was a press conference and a city planner sought to answer some of the questions people had about 15 minute cities. No, no, I didn't ask you if it would mean. I asked you, I asked you specific, I asked, no, no, he's lying again. I asked you, I just told you the answer. You there lie. will be in some places. Are they not where, removing parking spaces? Are they not removing places where cars can drive? Are they not making other places where cars, only electric cars can drive? So ultimately you're saying that there's gonna be less space and less infrastructure to support cars. So in the places less where, bikes, and where less bike lanes no, are built, overall, it could use car space. No, no, no. I overall, and overall, will the average person have less places to drive their car, less places to park their car, and more incentives not to have a car? Will there be less places for me to park a car in Edmonton under the 15-minute city? Let's try a very simple question. Okay, so let's, you, let's simplify them, yes or no. So fewer, it, Will there be less parking for my car in my new district under a 15-minute city? Free, you yes said, or no? You already said no. Yes, there will be less places where roadway changes are so done in other to words, accommodate more so things. So in other words, the 15-minute city is literally intention to try to drive us away from private car ownership and onto other means of travel like electric scooters and walking so we don't have the same mobility that we once had. I don't know about you, but when I was 16 years old, the most important thing in my life was getting my license because a car meant freedom, not just to me, to everybody else around. And now you guys want us to go along with a plan where we know the intention is to make that dream that the average 16 year old had not a reality anymore. We want, you want us to live in a world where the average 16 year old gets used to living in the same square blocks for 90% of their life. You want to make us live in a world where the average 16 year old needs to watch what they eat at the grocery store. We're sort of seeing misfire in communication where each individual has their own idea of what the plan is and they're not communicating with each other about what the other person thinks the plan is. A couple days after that happened, Edmonton City Councilor Andrew Knack went on Ryan Jesperson's podcast. It's called Real Talk with Ryan Jesperson. And he responded to some of the criticism that was leveled at that press conference. I'm going to play his remarks for you now. You know, I, I was surprised when it first started coming up, you know, pretty much at the beginning of this month. It's only, I've really only been starting to hear about it in the last four weeks. 
And it's odd because urban planning uh, land use bylaws are typically not the things that get uh, people excited about municipal politics. I, I love it, uh, but I also realize I'm typically an outlier in this scenario. And so to see the the notion of, of what essentially is, you know, what we would call walkable communities or thinking about what cities used to look like in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, where you had a neighborhood convenience store, or grocery store and pharmacy, um, to see that morph into what what we're now talking about, this notion about uh, government going to be locking people down, it's it's hard because I think in principle, everyone loves the idea of having things closer to their home to at least have the choice to access it. And yet now it's become something really nefarious in some people's minds. Now, I've spent a lot of time living in downtown cities. I would have to say one of the things I love most about it is not having to have a vehicle. I love being able to just walk across the street to get a bite to eat and walk down the street a couple blocks to get groceries. But of course, we have to consider the criticism as well. There is many people who no longer believe that anything the government does is in their best interest. And a lot of people have lost faith in their government following the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is my question of the day for you guys. What do you think about 15-minute cities? Do you see the appeal? Do you think it's misguided? Or do you think it's a bad plan from the city that's secretly intended to keep people locked within a short radius from their home? Let me know what you guys think and I'll read your comments next week. Okay guys, moving into my daily comment roundup now. User Claude Quinton said, the decision to enact the Emergency Act was wrong and the ruling that it was legal has put Canada in an unusual position. Big businesses will be concerned that if they publish a policy that the government disagrees with, the government could freeze their assets and their bank accounts just as happened in Cuba. And finally, one last comment here. User Hillquest Dual Support says, I watched the live release of your doc and appreciated that you chose to interview varying views. Nicely done. After one year and now that most of the truths have come out, I still don't believe it was necessary to invoke the Emergencies Act. Although three weeks of the Freedom Convoy, the protesters made their point and something needed to be done to end it. The protest would never have gone to that point if Justin Trudeau would have talked to them and it would have ended with an entirely different outcome. I really agree with some of the comments here. I don't think the Prime Minister did himself any favours by his inflammatory remarks calling protesters and supporters of the convoy, you know, a fringe minority with radical views. It only took the Prime Minister one year to admit that those remarks were a mistake following the Commission's report, which did in many ways kind of eviscerate the Prime Minister's actions during the Freedom Convoy. Okay guys, that's all I have for you today. A friendly reminder that you can still watch my documentary, The Freedom Occupation, online at freedomoccupation.ca. And if you want to support our work, you can absolutely do that on that website. And of course, you can also go to donate.tnc.news. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope that you guys have a great rest of your weekend and God bless.